in answering the question, what's next? So that there were two ways we could uh, uh, look at this question. One would be what I would call the academic way, would be uh, we have done so much work over the last 50 years on measuring inequality, measuring poverty, uh, using new data, new measures, new concepts, that uh, uh, probably we could ask ourselves after this incredible uh, achievement that we were able to uh, uh, do in the last 50 years, what should we do next? And I will say a few words about this. But the second way of looking at the question is to say poverty and inequality are changing in the world. And uh, we know more or less what is going on at the global level. We know more or less what is going on at the country level. Uh, we uh, have written uh, many of us on this uh, over the last uh, uh, 10, 15 years. Now the problem is to know what will happen next. For example, at the global level, we know that inequality in the world is going down, poverty is going down, uh, according to some specific concept. Uh, and we know also that inequality is going up in uh, several countries. Now, what is next? Should we expect that the reversal in uh, global inequality will continue? Should we expect that inequality will keep increasing in uh, several countries? Uh, I think this is another way we could look at the uh, uh, question about what's next. On the first uh, question for academics, the second one being more for global policy makers, uh, my uh, uh, way of answering the question would be with another question, which is what inequality are we talking about? By the way, we'll be talking more about inequality than poverty. Most of the issues that we'll be looking at are also valid in the case of poverty, but also Sabina has uh, already done a very good job in talking about this, and I will not repeat what uh, she has said. So in terms of inequality, what inequality should we be looking at? When you look at the literature, you have differences in terms of the measure that is being used. This is something that we have very much uh, dominated uh, over time. A second difference comes from the data that are being used. Household surveys, tax data, uh, DHS, uh, panel data, survey of consumer finance, all these data sets will allow us to see or to look at a different aspect of inequality. And then we have differences in concepts. We can look at the inequality of outcomes, whether it is income, consumption, wealth possibly. We can look at uh, non-economic outcomes. People, some people have been working on the inequality of happiness. Uh, and of course, inequality in terms of health or possibly education. Uh, we could look at the inequality of circumstances. And this is all the literature which deals with inequality of opportunity and uh, social mobility, for example, one being one aspect of this. We can talk about horizontal inequality between groups of people. And uh, within that, we can make a distinction between procedural inequality in terms of discrimination against uh, gender, uh, discrimination uh, among ethnic groups, uh, age groups. Uh, all these are different concepts which we have been working on so that today, when we say inequality has increased, what inequality are we talking about? And some people will say, oh yes, inequality in income has increased. Uh, we can see it with the Gini, etc. but inequality of opportunities has not increased and maybe it has gone down. What do we say and how do we handle all this? And uh, <coughs> this is uh, uh, an important question because we know that those various concepts do not move in the same direction. Uh, we know that uh, the distribution of earnings uh, may not be changing as the distribution of uh, income. Uh, we know many cases where the earning distribution has become more unequal, but nothing of this type happened when we were looking at income, basically because in between we had participation behavior changing, which meant that uh, the increase in inequality in earnings was uh, neutralized by uh, this uh, kind of behavior. Uh, when we look at uh, the top 10% or top 1% or top 5% share of gross income, which is now one very important way of looking at inequality, 
It may be the case that this is not changing over time, and we know it because there's been a lot of debate about this as a Gini coefficient based on equivalent income uh, and uh, based on household surveys. Uh, so this is the issue in front of different uh, aspects and measurement, what should we do? And conceptual differences matter too. Uh, it is uh, quite clear that uh, the present focus, for example, on top incomes by my uh, colleagues in the uh, World uh, Inequality Lab uh, in uh, the Paris School of Economics, uh, who are really working very much on this uh, concept of top uh, uh, X percent uh, uh, share in uh, uh, gross income, is uh, saying something about inequality which is not of the same type as equivalent income and the Gini. When we look at gross incomes, we are talking more about the command, the inequality in the command that people have on the economy. When especially we took look at the top income, this is exactly the point. And it is really, of course, worrying to see that this command is increasing over time in the uh, uh, extent of uh, uh, the type that we can see in a country like the United States. But this is not really what uh, necessarily a reflection of what is going on with the uh, inequality of welfare uh, uh, or uh, as uh, represented by equivalent incomes. So this is quite important to, to keep in mind that there are differences and when people say inequality has increased because the share of the top 1% increased, uh, they are right, but they are describing one phenomenon and another phenomenon which is uh, uh, a parallel, which may take uh, place at the same time, is the fact that inequality in standard of livings is uh, remaining constant or maybe is declining in the same country. It's very, very important to keep that in mind. Now, because of that, what can we do? There are two ways. One, we can try to integrate all those concepts. And uh, in, in the same way as and I plead guilty for that, uh, we have tried to integrate various dimensions of inequality and various dimensions of inequality and the way in which uh, uh, the work by Sabina and others with uh, uh, multidimensional uh, poverty is, is doing. Uh, we may try to integrate in the same uh, uh, framework uh, inequality of earnings, income, wealth, consumption, because we know that they are linked in a very, very specific way. So we can think about this, but at the same time, we know that this is very complicated. This will be relying on probably very strong assumptions. And uh, the data sets that we need to do that, in particular, that would integrate those various dimensions are simply not available. So uh, uh, I'm not sure that uh, we can go very far in that direction. And uh, the result, uh, 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 even when we uh, give an equal weight to different concepts, uh, I'm not sure that uh, this is uh, very important and very uh, useful for uh, policymakers. The other way, and this is a way I'm trying to defend, is really to use a dashboard approach. We have different concepts, fine. We have different data sets, fine. We have different measures, fine. What, let's try to think about one minimal set of indicators that would allow us to represent those various dimensions uh, and let's maybe not impose to the media and to the policy makers the uh, knowledge and the uh, mastering of all those concepts but let's make sure that in one place in uh, the knowledge that we have of inequality there is such a dashboard and this is the only slide I wanted to show which is uh, what uh, I would propose as an uh, inequality dashboard, which lists uh, several aspects which I believe are important and uh, aspects of inequality we are talking about uh, every day. Uh, so I will not go uh, in detail over the, var the various uh, uh, items, but you can see that the top you have the top 1% or top X% percent, uh, uh, gross income share uh, as used by uh, uh, several people uh, now in uh, the profession. Uh, of course, you have the living standard Gini based on equivalent uh, uh, income or consumption uh, uh, data in uh, uh, household surveys. Individual earnings, uh, which is very important and 
somehow is much less analyzed than other uh, concepts. Wealth uh, inequality indicator, which is unfortunately not always and not frequently available in particular in uh, developing countries. One thing which I believe is important is related to inequality of opportunities is it's not that difficult to compute what is a share of earnings inequality or living standard inequality that is due to the family background of the people. And this is an indication of the importance of what some people call circumstances in uh, uh, the present inequality and to check whether this is changing over time or from a cohort to another is not that difficult. And uh, this is not a statistic that you will be looking and you'll be producing every year, but this is something that should appear in the, in the dashboard. Now, we want also to take into account other dimensions of welfare, health, but what matters is not the inequality of health, uh, 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 self-reported health status. What matters is the correlation with income, or maybe the correlation with some other uh, economic variables. Uh, and uh, uh, we also can look at uh, education, but I believe that what matters is really more the inequality and the correlation with family income of the uh, uh, scores, like the PISA scores, etc. We can talk, we must introduce something about informality uh, especially when dealing with developing countries. And then, of course, something about the uh, uh, gender gap and something about the ethnicity gap. Now, poverty should also be part of the story. And to some extent, this dashboard, we already have it in the sense that, as Martin said at the beginning, we tend to look at uh, what is going on in the country, both in terms of inequality and in terms of uh, poverty. And in terms of poverty, of course, this dashboard approach uh, is implicit in all what has been done lately to take into account the multidimensionality. I have two minutes left, so it will be done for this, so let me go back to that if you want to keep uh, looking at it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, let me say simply a few words about the second way of looking at the question. What will happen next with the global income distribution? In, uh, some time ago, I called the uh, in the drop in uh, global inequality, an historical reversal. Today, I must say that I'm starting to doubt about whether it is really a uh, 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 one direction, a one way uh, reversal. The reversal was very much due to China. China today is more or less at the middle of the distribution, which means that uh, statistically, we know that the impact of faster growth in China than in the rest of the world will not have very much impact on inequality. And in a few years, it will have a negative impact or it will increase in inequality. What I think is important is the fact that in the 2000s, the, one of the big push toward less inequality of the world was due to very fast growth, acceleration of growth in, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa and also in Latin America. But the problem with this uh, episode, to some extent, is the fact that this was very much linked to a very uh, uh, nice or uh, high cycle, high part of the cycle in terms of international prices of commodities. Now, if we look at uh, the average uh, growth, or if we look at uh, over uh, long cycles of uh, uh, commodity prices, we see that uh, the growth of uh, those countries, Latin America and Sub-Saharan -Sub Africa, which rely on commodities, which we, uh, the growth of which rely on commodities, is not that great. And if we look uh, prospectively to what may happen, my calculation is very simple. The global economy is growing more or less at 4% a year. The demand for commodities will be growing more or less at 4% a year. This may include changes in prices at the same time as changes in quantity. But the point is that the demand, the total value of the demand will grow at 4% uh, uh, a year. The demographic growth rate in Sub-Saharan Africa is 3% more or less until the middle of this century, which means that on average, if we assume that there will be a full cycle or maybe several full cycles of commodity prices, on average, the region will be growing at 1% per capita. Now, this is less than emerging countries. This is less than the 
long run potential growth rate in developed countries, which means that in the long run, what we observe today is more or less some forces toward some divergence. And uh, I believe that this is a very, very important point. We cannot allow for ethical reasons for people working on development. Development is, before all, convergence uh, across the world. Uh, so this is going against this uh, basic objective, and uh, uh, something has to be done about this. And the second thing is that we also have to realize that there are some danger uh, associated to that. And uh, with uh, the uh, migration pressure that we see today and uh, the problem that it raises, we have to realize that uh, some more inequality in the world will probably go in the same uh, direction. So I think that this is something that as a development community, we have to uh, take, uh, to keep in mind. Uh, I know that many people uh, in this uh, uh, room work about uh, this. I um, was well, sorry to miss uh, John Page's presentation yesterday about industrialization in Africa, but I would say that today this is really the most important issue on which we should work when we look at global inequality, what next? Thank you very much. <laughs>